Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Osin Curious Podcast webcast. I am here this week with two of my favorite Osin Curious members, uh, Dutch Osin Guy. You want to say hi to everybody? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful week. I had one. Uh, maybe Ritu has also had a wonderful week. Maybe you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Nico. Uh, Ritu here, uh, Osin techniques on twitter uh happy to be here and happy that you can join us and let's uh take it away Mike. Cool. excellent so this week is a little bit different for us here at us and curious uh we do not have a guest we figured it would be good to have a little bit of a downtime with our audience with some common questions and and thoughts and some of the resources from the past two weeks uh that we can talk about so what we're going to be doing is, is uh, for those people that are uh, in our audience here, feel free to put things in the chat, ask a question in the Q&A, and we're happy to discuss those things. Otherwise, we're going to talk about um, a discussion point here. Uh, Ritu, Nico, and I have been talking about dark web and how to use it and when to use it in our investigations. And I just wanted to kind of bring that out because... Uh, and Ritu, Nico, I mean, chime in here. One of the things that I frequently hear in, whether it's a CTF, the, the SAN CTFs that I run or other ones, or or just other people that are like dark web, everything that I need for OSINT is in the dark web. And so I'm finding that people are like starting out trying to gather information from the dark web. Are you seeing this too? Ritu, go ahead. What's that? Thank you. Um I, I'd say I, I've heard that before where a lot of people are starting with the dark web, but I, I would say that I would do it the other way around and I would go to the clear web, the surface web, and start there where there's so much more information, right? Whether you're talking about, we talk about the surface web, we talk about the deep web as well, right? Um, yeah. But the dark web, I kind of leave that for specific asks, right? You know, what's the objective? What's the goal? Um, and, it, and if it does, and it's only pointed to the dark web, I would start there. But in, in those cases, when, as Micah mentioned, whether it's a CTF, m my starting point definitely would be the surface web. That's, a, that's where a bulk, bulk of the information is going to be. So can you give us an example of what type of an investigation would make you think, you know what, I should really go to the dark web at all? Maybe not first, but, but this is probably going to lead me into the dark web for some type of data collection. Can you think of a, an example of a good time when that would be uh, important? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, definitely the, the stuff that comes to mind is, um, you know, whether it's um, the legal sales of firearms, for example, or, or drugs, that type of stuff. Um, if there's something where we have a tip that an individual may be on the dark web, um, I will still start with that surface web part of it, but I will definitely shortly after move into the dark web to see if they have a foot online footprint over there as well. Okay. And Nico, you've done a, you've done law enforcement investigations, uh, commercial investigations, you've done terrorist stuff. When do you go into the dark web in your investigations? Um, well, quite similar to what Rita just said, but you have to have at least a hunch that you needed to look there. So on average, uh, for my normal day-to-day -day investigations, which were in my biggest time in law enforcement, there was absolutely no need to go on the dark web. Because let's be honest, at its high rise, there were probably somewhere around 13,000 of pages hosted up on the dark web on the tor network specifically which is a fraction of the entire internet so you have to have a good hunch uh, but recently i've been spending a little bit more time especially during these corona times on the dark web because we had a lot of malware and ransomware uh, in europe and in the netherlands and those platforms or at least those ransomware sites are being hosted up on mostly the tor network and by, for instance, an hospital being ransomized, I don't even know if that's a correct English word, but at least they got infected with a piece of malware, which basically locked down their computers and they needed to pay a certain amount of cryptocurrency. Yep. But they were pointed towards the dark web. So that led me to those places to do some further investigations. Um, also, 
um, people trying to um, move around money, cryptocurrencies will often lead you that on a dark web uh, by washing them through another Tumblr to another Tumblr to make it not stand out. But on average, I, I got to be honest, it's probably the last place where I will look, which does not mean that I will not look there. But when it when I look at my standard operating procedures, I will normally, quite similar to what Rizu says, clear web, so the place where everybody can can look, then the deep web, which basically is the non-indexed web, and then uh, the darker webs of this world, I2P, Tor, whatever. Yeah. 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 It, I I totally agree with both of you that that while it might be a step of a process, and it's interesting you know, on those and curious webcasts here, we don't we don't really we haven't really covered like the OSINT process. Uh, Walnut, one of our pan, one of our attendees here, just said, "Hey, I'm starting my first job. What are some tips that you can give?" And I'm thinking, you know what? One of my biggest tips is to to create or use a process that is tried and true, tested, and useful for doing uh, whatever it, whatever type of OSINT you're doing. And, and but one of the things that we don't we haven't really covered is is what is that methodology? What is that process? Because if you use a process that standardized step bait and step by step flowchart, if you will, of activity, if you use that, then you can properly prioritize when you go to or what leads you to the dark dark web resources. You gave a perfect example, Nico. You have something that's a dot i two p or dot onion uh, URL or or resource. Well, that's going to take you to the dark webs because those are the pseudo top level domains. But otherwise, if you're just searching for people, if you're looking up even the cryptocurrency stuff, there's a ton of that on the surface or the deep web that you don't even have to go into the dark web. And using that process, the question then becomes, how do you get that process? Where do you create that process? And what, um, what do you use? I think for many organizations, and please chime in here, panelists, um, for many organizations, they've created them themselves. So when you're doing your law enforcement investigations, you have this step-by-step -step or roughly step-by-step -step process for how do you collect and where you collect from and when do you collect. But for people just getting into open source intelligence, it's more this amorphous, here's a cloud of resources, a cloud of sites, and the when do I use this versus when do I use this can be very confusing. I also think that that's the difference between just gathering information, looking around on the internet, and actually trying to make intelligence because open source intelligence basically says it. It's not just puzzling pieces together. It's actually trying to answer a question that someone can take a decision upon or that leads you to something else. And I think that's the common mistake made while with people starting out in open source intelligence, you need to come up with a question that you want to find an answer to, or someone will ask you that question and you will help them with your knowledge and your toolkit to try to find answers to those questions. And you can only do that by doing it somewhat structured. Yeah. Otherwise it will just be looking around on the internet. Yeah. I agree. And I think there's a thoroughness component of the open source intelligence, right? It's, it's, um, I've seen a lot of uh, people that are just starting out in OSINT do some of these challenges that are out there, whether it's the the uh, quiz time or something else, and it really does feel like a shotgun approach. It's I'm gonna I'm gonna search for all the things and then find what is the the perfect answer, the perfect result, and go down that one path instead of this methodical progression through the resources that are trusted and truthful, um, and moving towards something that's more obscure. Ritu, is that your experience too, or do you have different uh, views? Yeah, no, I um, I was going to say a couple of things, actually, uh, in reference to what Nico mentioned, definitely like that separation between what's information, what's intelligence, and definitely having, um, I like to call it, I, I like to ask the question, like, what's the intelligence question we're trying to answer here? And then that, taking that, and not only that, and, and really, I'm just kind of rephrasing or, or adding to what Nico and, and you mentioned, but um, turning it into actionable intelligence, right? How do, how do I turn this information that I found? Um, how can I make this useful for the investigator? Um, just another, uh, just going back to, I know Walnut um, mentioned this uh, in the chat there, um, 
what tips can you give someone who actually found the first job? One of my things would be practice. Uh, yeah. Honestly, like when I first started out where we all start somewhere, um, practice, the more you practice, whether you participate in a CTF or um, there's cases at work that you just start on, you, you start learning, you learn from your mistakes. Um, not only that, I find one of the biggest things for me in, in my career has been, you know, in the, in, when I was starting off, it was managers who would ask a group of 10 of us who, hey, do you want to take on this project? Do you want to take on this? And, and sometimes we don't want to try something that's not comfortable or that's not my portfolio. Okay. Yeah. You know, I worked in national security for a while and, and I really enjoyed that. But if it wasn't in my portfolio, I would still take that on because I'm like, I can learn from this. And so saying yes, more than saying no, I found just added to my experience and it, it made me a better analyst over the years. So that's, that's some, um, a few points at least that you could find helpful. Yeah. And if I might add to that, when you, or at least my experience is if you start out and for instance, new platforms rise or new uh, social media outlets come up or emerge, start out with looking on those platforms for information that you know about or feel comfortable. For instance, look for an artist or a singer that you know about where you know what results to expect, because then you know, uh, you will probably figure out a more fast way to move around on that platform because you know what can be found about an individual that you know all about. Or at least that's my tradecraft trick. If I want to look into a new platform or a place that I'm unfamiliar with, I immediately start to look for, for instance, myself or someone I know really well just to get that look and feel, hey, what kind of information or what kind of identifiers are on these places, these places of the internet that I know about, where to look for, why do, where do I find, find an avatar, why, where do I find a username, and then what can I figure out from that username, maybe an email address, and so on, and so on. But look for something you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to add to Nico's point. I think I love that idea of um, whether you're searching for yourself, right? Uh, find out what your own digital footprint looks like. Get comfortable with that. I, I love that idea. I think that's an excellent start. Or I've had I've had close friends say, "Hey, what can you find on me yeah. on the internet?" I'm like. Yeah. You know, I'm like, okay, well, uh, I'm like, I can probably there find are things you can never unsee, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, are you sure? I'm like, so I've, I've asked that, but I've had a couple and, and, but it gave me, uh, I'm like, okay, well, this is what I found. They're like, how'd you find that? Right. It always gets to that, but that practice is so important. So there's different ways to do it as we've mentioned here. So the, definitely those are some starting points. So I think what I've heard, uh, in, and I'll, I'll add to, to what, what you've said, I've heard um, look for common, uh, common information that you know about or common data that you know about, Nico, you just said that, uh, known data so that you can validate, hey, this is where that kind of stuff will be. This is the bio, this is a username, collect that. And then those are gonna be your, your other uh, bits of data to research. Um, experiment on new platforms, Nico, you just said that experimenting on new platforms when they come out. Again, it gets you onto sometimes the cutting edge, but it also tests your skill for what do I need to look at and what do I need to collect? Um, I think before you experiment with new platforms, you really do have to come up with that, almost what Sin Windy did, the, the what do I need to look for um, in a user's profile, you're always going to look for an avatar. You're always going to look for that username. You're always going to look for the bio, when they joined, the, their connections, followers, friends, whatever, and then their activities. And then, you know, from there, okay, how do I find those things on this new platform? And then I'll add just two things. Um, Ritu, you already said practice, 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 right? It's, it, it's not just practicing within your discipline, whatever you're doing, but getting that breadth of knowledge of trying new things. And that's where I think the, the CTFs and the quiz time challenges and all those come into play. But we're seeing a lot more uh, uh, trainings and workshops that are free or very low cost, like Today in the news section, we're going to cover another resource from First Draft News um, that, that can help you broaden that experiential base so that you can recognize things um, that you hadn't before. And then 
my last piece of, of uh, advice to Walnut and to all of you just starting out is find a community that you feel comfortable with and join a group of people that are smarter than you, that are more experienced with you, more experienced than you to, to learn from them and to use as sounding boards. Uh, I mean, whether you like Slack or whether you like uh, Discord or whether you like LinkedIn, there are resources out there, communities of thousands of people that are offering jobs, that are offering resources, offering uh, to answer your questions um, on all of the different platforms. Find them, join them, and watch and participate. Um, join that those communities. Yeah. And if I may add one thing to it for uh, employers that are listening, uh, I think, really, I think that employers should fa facilitate their researchers a little bit more with space or at least room to experiment. So, hmm. Tell me uh, more about that. You mean? Well, well, looking back at, for instance, my experience in law enforcement, I, I was granted an X amount of time every week to experiment. So to look on new platforms, figure out how they work, uh, maybe uh, do a CTF to become better or reach out to the community and learn from them. Uh, because it's not always about doing research all the time. You need to do research to do research, if you know what I'm saying. Okay, so you need to do research to do your, your main yeah. core work better. Yeah. So okay. basically we would have uh, what we call NERD hours, nerd hours, never ending <laughs> research and development hours, which, <laughs> which, which work uh, right. because, because they made us, the, those were the opportunities where we get to install a VM and learn how to install a VM and how to tweak a VM or fine tune a VM or step up your operation security. And I think that's really a, a part of, uh, I think online investigations in general that employers should be more aware of because this is a landscape that moves so fast and things change so fast that you will need to have time to adapt. Yeah. So employers need to have that flexibility essentially. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Or well, at least, yeah, need to offer that flexibility to you. But yes. I, I think it's a recognition, like you just said, and that's an extremely important point, is that the world of OSINT is not like malware research where we have core things that never, ever change. And if you learn them, you always know them. In our in our social media gathering and all, well, actually, there are things like that. I mean, like DNS and IP addresses and, and some of the content is, is less changing. But if you're doing anything with social media, if you're doing anything with dark web or or some of the other resources that are out there, the world is changing. And if you don't stay up with it, then you're not going to be as successful um, in the long run. So keeping up with it, experimenting and researching um, and just, you know, being, dare I say, curious um, is, is an important fact of, of our work. Yeah, absolutely. Be curious and ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. And uh, Lockpicking Pete, welcome uh, to the webcast here, um, has uh, posted also in the chat saying that uh, I, for him, he started out in, uh, in March playing quiz time and then started talking to people and then um, visiting and doing some classes like uh, last week, the Fundamentals of Investigation by uh, Osink Geek and Christina Licati. There are and this is the, one of the neatest things is that there are so many different people with different perspectives doing OSINT trainings now. Have you noticed this? I, I love it. Yeah, um, I really enjoy it because I've, I've attended a fair amount of uh, open source intelligence courses over my years at law enforcement and outside it, and now I'm teaching. And I've never come across a 100% identical course, which is so awesome. In every class, you will learn something or something niche or something specific. Yeah, really interesting. I would also add to that, that um, sometimes people think if you teach this stuff, okay, you know, um, oh, you're not going to learn anything. I, I find for teaching for law enforcement over the years, there's always something to learn. Um, yeah like I, and and long as you're open to it which you want to be that I, I find you know I'm learning things every day um I've been teaching open source for years now but uh, the learning never stops but it's also like Micah said you want to stay curious you want to say that interest um I, I find when you have that passion behind what you're doing and if you're really interested in the topic um 
you'll you'll be more open to learning. Uh, but I definitely think everyone has something to you know offer. So it's it's nice to see um, the differing different offerings out there w- with uh, OSINT courses and, and you know who's teaching and whatnot. Yeah, I think there's there's really two pieces there. One is um, the farther along you go, the more you have to check your ego. Uh, you might know a lot about OSINT, but there's always people out there that maybe don't know more, but they know different than you. And right. if you Absolutely. you know are thinking that, well, I know everything about DNS, I don't have to do that. Or I know everything about Facebook, I don't have to listen to that. You're missing out on that nuance, that tip, that trick, yep. that could help you uh, break open a case. So uh, being humble enough to say, I know a lot, but I don't know everything and teach me. Uh, I find that really incredible. And also I couldn't like, agree more. Well said. Yeah, yeah really. Well, and like 100%. Lock Picking Pete just put, posted, you know, it, it's an incredible community that's, that's really grown up around the OSINT, uh, OSINT world that we do have every place from Reddit and LinkedIn to Discord to Slack, people that want to help and want to make sure that, that people joining the field are encouraged and supportive. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, yeah. thank you, Ritu, uh, Dutch. Thank you to our audience for uh, for helping us with that segment. Um, I think, you know, going forward into the new year, uh, Nico, Ritu, and the rest of the OSINT Curious Pete members and I are going to be talking about ways that we can transform this current webcast and podcast into something that's more useful, more interactive, and, and maybe, you know, uses our time a little bit differently than we have in the last 50 episodes. Um, so stay tuned for uh, for that in the coming months. Yeah. All right. So uh, shall we go to the news? Yeah, let's go ahead and do some news. Let's do it. Nico, tell me about Black Friday deals. What are these things and why do you care? Um, well, you know my saying, the Dutch are cheap. <laughs> <laughs> you were waiting on that, right? I was. So, yeah. I was. <laughs> No, uh, really, I'm 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 always looking for these deals because every Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Thanksgiving around that period, you will have awesome cyber orientated deals. But over the time, I'm seeing more and more deals pop up that are uh, for open source intelligence specialists or enthusiasts really nice. You get great discounts on VPNs, discounts on uh, password managers, or um, tools that will help you collect and organize your information and even open source intelligence courses nowadays. So I thought, well, instead of people looking around, why not make one repository or at least try to make one repository with useful links? So that was my yeah. giving I've back actually to the community. Seen it- I've actually seen a couple of the uh, people, again, using GitHub to to just compile this list. In fact, one of them, and I wish I've, I had done this before the show, one of them had at the bottom of the list other people's lists of Black Friday deals. Um, and for those of you that, that aren't familiar with it, Black Friday deals are usually those sales that go on around the United States Thanksgiving time, which is um, this past Thursday and Friday. Um, and then tomorrow is Cyber Monday. We'll try to get this webcast out so that you can have the benefit of knowing that Nico made the page while you can still take advantage of these, these things. Um, but uh, yeah, some really good deals. And, and what I like is that it's everything from uh, tools that we might use to collect, visualize, or even protect ourselves. So there's VPNs on there. There's other stuff like YubiKeys and all uh, as well. Cool. Awesome. Well, Nico, you were also telling me about this tweet that you saw um, by uh, AD underscore GQ. Can you tell us yeah. about uh, what it is and tell our podcasters what it is? Well, I thought it just was interesting because I have a large background in doing uh, counterterrorism, which does not imply that this picture has something to do with terrorism, but more in general, how people in uh, a lot of Arabic regions will dress. And it basically shows pictures of persons, how they dress in Oman or in Kuwait or, or whatever, or at least their um, kind of quote unquote, an official, official way of wearing their uh, blouses or uh, the things they put on their head. And I thought it was really interesting because especially when you're doing, for instance, uh, video verification or image verification, by having these pieces of information, it could help you pivot quicker into a certain area of the world. I come to a better understanding on what type of individuals am I looking 
at, with what background. So that's why I got triggered by this picture. Yeah, yeah it kind of goes into that um, thing. And actually, I'll I'll bring it up here. The um, uh, it, it kind of goes into the what do you look for in, when analyzing an image that would tell you that something is in a certain part of the world. Um, if we can look at somebody's style of dress and know that 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 um, that style of dress is from a certain region of the world, then that can focus our our thoughts and our research in that area. Also, um, you saw that, I think it was lock picking. Pete had yeah. this link, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I, basically, I was tagged in a tweet where they expected me to pop up in a video because it was uh, lock picking. Pete picked the Netherlands or to do some demoing. So they expected my picture, which was kind of a laugh, but the geo uh, so geotips.net has a platform where they will tell you uh, what kind of specific characteristics to look for, for instance, on roads in certain areas of the world. So if you were picking uh, Germany, for instance, and now you could see the country flag, you could see the bollards that are common on the highways there, you would see the road signs and the way they are formatted with uh, their license plate numbers and so on and so on. So that helps you get a better understanding of, hey, I found a picture on the internet, I do not exactly know where in the world this is, but maybe by taking the time to look at a domain like geotips.net, you now can learn, hey, the bollards with this color and this framing or these borders are ger normally in Germany or in Poland, which makes you help. Uh, and, and that goes back to something that Ritsu and, and we were all talking about in the first segment was that you gaining that experience for this is in that part of the world um, can help you in your research, right? In your actual OSINT work that you're doing. So understanding that the ballers look like this in that part of the world, when you come across a picture or a video that you're trying to validate or verify, that automatically helps you frame where that that uh, the location might have been. Um, so doing games helps us in our work. That's what you can tell your management. They might, and if you're, they're supportive, like Nico's management, maybe they'll give you some time every week to do GeoGuessr or do hey, some. Hey, boss, I really need a PlayStation 5. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Well, there's something there that oh, sends something, something. Dark web. Yes. <laughs> there oh, you I go. Love <laughs> I love it. So, Nico, one of the things that you, we're just going to stick with you, buddy. You're just like the whole focus of this new segment. <laughs> okay. Um, you, so you tweeted out this tip about using Parlay, or if you're American, Parler, Parler. Um, that social media platform that's becoming more and more popular. Uh, why don't you tell us what you found? Yeah, well, basically when a new platform emerges, I want to see how um, uh, people are trying to lure new people on a platform. And what they will normally will do is go to the most common platforms, for instance, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and say, hey, come join us here over at Parler or Parlay. And what they would do, they will drop links and posts coming from that new platform on a very well-known platform. So my technique would be was to look for the URL structure where people would share uh, posts and comments. And I figured out, hey, I got 24,000 results based upon parlor.com forward slash comment or parlor.com forward slash post, meaning it could be a comment on parlor or post that's publicly being shared and indexed by Google. But then my assumption was, so what if someone wanted to spread that message outside of parlor? just to get the word out or to make a statement someone else, I would now exclude the domain parlor.com. So I would do a side operator parlor.com. And now I got almost double the amount of results, which for me uh, made me aware of. So if someone has a new platform, but they want to be known somewhere else or lure new people in, recruit new members, maybe that can be a technique. And with a pretty basic Google search, you could now figure that out to look on those places where people are spreading a narrative or maybe spreading it propaganda, quote unquote. Yeah. Well, see, this is, again, going back to what we talked about in the beginning is that in your assessments that you're doing, your investigations, starting out with the known process of 
I'm going to take these keywords and go to my uh, search engine of choice or Google first and then my search engine of choice. Um, and following that process, you'd be amazed at what happens. And then as we'll see, as the platforms get more and more popular, many times they will shut off or reduce the amount of things that, that the search engines can use. Uh, TikTok is a good example of this. Um, back when TikTok first came on uh, came on the scene we saw that you could you could google a ton of things on tiktok and then over time they started reducing that and reducing that and reducing that so um and now you need to go to the platform to do your OSINT harvesting but but starting out with that process of i'm going to use google see what i can do with just a couple of things um that's a great tip there nico one of the other big topics that's been in the news recently are sock puppets or research accounts, synthetic identities, whatever you want to call them. Those personas that we might use on social media platforms to distance our personal selves from the OSINT work that we're doing. And one of the main ways that people have in the past uh, created those photos for people's avatars and profile pictures for our sock puppets is by using this person does not exist.com or generated.photos, the website. Um, one of the things that we wanted to highlight this week is that generated photos has this slash faces repository where they don't just sh show you an image and then throw it away. Like it feels like this person does not exist does, um, but they will actually show you a whole bunch of faces and you can narrow it down based upon ethnicity and other things, gender, et cetera. And if you want, and this was one of the other neat things about generated photos, that's generated.photos slash, slash faces. If you then go over here to the not anonymizer, the anonymizer allows you to upload a photo and then it will pull those um, generated photos from its site that look similar to that image. Um, Whereas this is not perfect, this is not going to give you multiple views of the same person, it gets you pretty close to some of that. And I know that for some of the social media platforms out there, having multiple photos of a single face that is computer generated um, is really useful to maintaining an identity or an account on it. Um, have either of you played around with generated photos a little bit? Played around with generated photos forward slash faces, but not with anonymizers because I'm very worried about uploading photos to platforms like these. So the idea, Nico, would be you take something from this person does not exist or one of the faces and then upload that to yeah. the uploaded photo. So yeah. you're not uploading a case photo or of your target or anything like that. Although if you're allowed to, that might give you a broader search base, right? If, if you have a, a distinct photo of a person's face, you may be able to upload it here and do some aging or do some uh, facial uh, things with, um, uh, with facial hair or different hairstyles that could help broaden your search for image searches. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's right. still an interesting time we are living yeah. in and it's going so f so fast this this ai around faces definitely yeah definitely cool um well yeah on osin unleash uh you bring up a good point you're still uploading from your system so some of the platform like that platform would then see the path to that file on your system. And that's why you're gonna be, I, that's why we always suggest that you have an analyst platform for doing your actual OSINT investigation. So you're gonna be uploading it from a genericized account. Um, you might've stripped out any metadata from the picture, making it as, as uh, generic as possible before uploading it. And again, that's only if you're allowed to do that by the rules um, that are specified in your scoping for your assessment or in, in your mission. Um, verifying content. We talked about this in the first part of our, um, our of our webcast podcast here. Uh, first draft news has this un, has another page here uh, where you can go through and test out how what you would do to verify online content. And this is so important. Um, I think Nick's Intel, one of our members, um, and some other people pointed out a a parlor hack 
Did you all see this? It was like a hack that was going around. It was a PHP, my admin. No, it was a WordPress. That was it. It was a WordPress yeah, it, hack. It was, it was, I think it was almost two years old or something. Yeah, it was a while old, but people were like, oh, Parler's hacked. And and the reality was, is if you had done the research, you would have seen that it wasn't. So I'm sorry, were you going to say something? No, no, I'm good. Okay. So, um, and so this is uh, this first draft news um, dot org page. And again, all of these URLs will be in our show notes. Uh, it, it's really nice because it teaches you how to do some of this. So you, you have not only a page that is like, hey, when was this picture taken? Uh, but it also will show you how to find the answer, which always is great. That's what I love about like quiz time and some of the other online quizzes is that they show you the process multiple ways for gaining and getting access to the answers and getting us smarter. Nico, I know that you tweeted out this keyword search coming yeah. to the Instagram. Yeah, I just picked it up. Uh, the Verge, um, they basically said, hey, keyword search is coming to Instagram period. So uh, I did some, <laughs> I did some searching on Instagram and I, I did some testing, but there is censorship in place. So uh, certain keywords uh, are not allowed to search hmm. on Instagram, for instance, vaccine or QAnon or those keywords, <laughs> they will get blurred out. And um, it also looks to me, but maybe that will change over time that it, ha that it has not have been rolled out on every country. So okay. if I have toggle between VPNs, between countries, uh, most European countries, it will work. United States will most definitely work. Canadian will work. But Asian countries, in my opinion, it seems a little bit different. But I'm not 100% deep, knee deep in there yet. So, But still, we get at least a little bit more opportunity to start using uh, keywords on Instagram. And that by itself, from an open source and sales perspective, uh, is only a good thing, right? But yeah, censorship right. and platforms. Hmm. I, I think um, it's, is it correct? It's only on mobile right now or is it on the desktop version too? Because I think when mobile. I checked it wasn't, okay, yeah, mobile. that's what I thought. Yeah, because yeah. I, I did test it out a bit and uh, I think on the desktop, it wasn't available, but on the, on mobile, it was there. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's something, something to uh, keep an eye on. Well, and, and both of you bring up some great points there about the things that we do in open source intelligence aren't global instantaneously. And the features that we use, you might need to alter how you gain access to the endpoint. You know, so so Instagram, you just going to it via a web page, you're going to get different content, different features and functionality than if you use a mobile device. Um, and you might need to change, like Nico said, you know, what, what VPN you're using. Uh, so you have to build that flexibility into your, um, into your investigation methodology, but also you have to try things. Like Nico, you said, hey, I tried different VPN endpoints on different countries just because you had the idea that this might be geo-restricted. Um, geo so uh, uh, building that in and building that time for research is so very important or that time to listen to OSINT Curious webcast because we'll bring it to you. We'll bring it, the, the knowledge of Nico to you live. Nico, you were really, really upset when YouTube DL was taken off of, um, uh, well, was taken out of uh, GitHub. Yeah. Um, um, it's back, right? It's back, right? Yeah. So that's basically the message for now. GitHub took it down, or at least it was a DCMA request saying, hey, um, you are violating tosses, uh, copyright restrictions, all that kind of stuff. But like, let's be honest. Yes, YouTube download the command line tool, because that's what we're talking about. YouTube DL uh, can be used to download information from various video platforms that uh, you normally would have to pay for. But from an open source intelligence perspective or maybe a journalistic uh, perspective or sometimes you just need to preserve certain, certain pieces of information, YouTube DL was probably and still is one of my most powerful tools to quickly download a video from not only coming from YouTube but be because it had, the name is YouTube DL but it can download from another a lot of pl platforms. So yeah. 
I was down when it was down, and now I'm up again. It works again. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Well, and, and it, it's a very uh, useful tool that, that that can be used across multiple sites. And it's a great case where GitHub was like, hey, we we took it off because we got these DMCA requests. And for those of you that don't know what YouTube download is, it, it allows you to download videos. Um, and uh, we use that many times to download the evidence for the, I'm sorry, the, the data from different platforms to store it locally on our systems in case it, it might be deleted by the owner or removed by the, the platform itself. Um, the, so um, I love the fact that GitHub actually reversed its decision and put in place rules for when they will go ahead and take action on DMCA um, types of violations. Um, they, they, and they published it in that blog post, which is terrific. Um, and yeah, as Josh uh, points out, there's there's always the internet archive. Uh, when the site, when 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 the YouTube downloader came off of, of GitHub, uh, the YouTube-DL uh, website got put up. There were a lot of other places out there that were, were hosting this content for people as well. So just because it goes off of the main platform doesn't mean we lose access to it forever. This is something that I saw tweeted out. It is knitter.net, which allows you to take a look at somebody's, I'll just pull up a random person's Twitter here. Um, this is a, a way of using Twitter um, without actually using Twitter. Knitter.net um, pulls in Twitter content, whether it's information from different users like OSINT techniques here, you can still see that we're on knitter.net. We're not on Twitter's platform. We get all the information about Ritu's profile and we get access to her tweets without logging into Twitter, without Twitter capturing our analytics and giving us uh, restrictions. So yeah, it there. doesn't always seem to be 100% up to date. I would imagine that they're retrieving this data, probably not on demand, but just grabbing it. I don't know if it if it is an API call. It seems really quick for an API call, though. Uh, it feels like they should be. Well, I don't know. Um, but a uh, neat resource it's again. Proxy. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a, a different interface to get to that same Twitter content when you are being um, restricted. Um, and while we're talking about Twitter, Twitter, wow. While we're talking about Twitter, uh, Twitter released a new feature. Nico, Ritu, what are your thoughts about these fleets? Which to me look like the Instagram stories, look like yeah. all of the other same things. Honestly, I really them. don't care about the feature, <laughs> but I do care about it from an open source sales perspective. You can now find new information. And I also saw some tweets where people saying were that you could look at fleets without notifying the poster that you looked at the fleet. And, and that's that, what that- From an object perspective, yeah, could yeah. be interesting. But. Well, and that's what that was about is that when uh, there were two things, I think, with the with the fleets, one is that if you interact with somebody else's fleet, even if your account is private, they get access to direct message you something like that. Um, I think they this, get a direct message. They get a direct message. You respond. Yeah, it goes right into their inbox or something like that. Yeah. Um, which is not great for privacy. I would imagine that that probably is going to be fixed fixed uh, soon because that seems like something that Twitter might care about. Um, and then the other thing was the read receipts of knowing that who actually or what accounts clicked on the links. Ritu, what are your thoughts on, on fleets? You in favor? You not in favor? Honestly, I'm kind of on board with uh, what Nico mentioned. I, I don't really... I don't really care for it too much, except for obviously from that OSINT perspective. Um, but the, uh, the main thing is um, just your own OPSEC if you're looking at a target and, you know, what if you accidentally click on it? I mean, and, you know, thinking back now, I think, uh, what does your SOC account look like? You know, if you're logged in and that type of stuff, is that going to tip off someone? Um, yeah. So I probably personally, so on the work side, for sure. I probably won't be using fleets. I'm not really into that. I think I, I watched a couple and I was like, I really don't like this. Like, yeah. I, I, I don't like the look of it at all, but uh, that's just personally. But LinkedIn yeah, did a similar thing recently also. 
LinkedIn. Yeah, they did the right. similar thing. Everybody's mimicking each other to their last feed. Yeah, and Instagram like, has the yeah. stories Instagram. and Snap has the story. I mean, it's it's yeah. like all of these social it's media overkill. platforms are just looking and going, hey, we could do a live streaming thing. We could do recorded video. Next up on Twitter, filters or whatever. Yeah. No like, way. Yeah. <laughs> we need that. Do y'all see the OSIN Dojo? Got released in the last couple yep. of weeks. Osin Dojo by Sin Windy. Although when he released it, he didn't really tell you. But one of the first challenges was to find out who's behind. I think the first thing we, we as Osin Curious did, hey, did you see, guys see Osin Dojo? And everybody was, yeah, let's figure out who made this. Yeah. I think like two minutes later, yes, it's Sin Windy. Yeah. But, but to his credit, he he left some uh, some nuggets, uh, yeah. some trails for us in in some of the things that he did. But, but he put some great work in there. He put some time in here. Yeah, it looks like yep. fun. I I got to be honest, I didn't spend too much time because I was teaching last week. But uh, I will definitely take a look. Looks like a, a great repository, especially for people trying to get better in open source intelligence. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know what Osin Dojo is, uh, I haven't gone too deep into this either, but uh, essentially uh, you earn a rank on the Dojo, which I think gets you a, a digital badge. And you you uh, visit the site, osindojo.com slash ranks slash, and then you see what you need to do. And then once you do the things here, like to earn the student one level, uh, you need to participate in an OSINT CTF. You need to do uh, attempt two OSINT quizzes, et cetera, and then provide the proof that you did that to the OSINT Dojo platform, and then they will grant you a digital badge. And it's, I found it interesting because a lot of the things that Sin Wendy's got in here is, is engagement, right? It's, it's how it's to get incentivize people to, to be active in their learning and their sharing of what they're learning. And I, I absolutely love that. Um, so, um, oh, and also there's this resources section, which has links to uh, different blogs, different uh, other information resources that you, that Sim Windy and those and Dojo people really like. So more resources, yes. And some of them are nice. Like here's a bunch on Gab, which, you know, I, I don't know if anybody re remembers Gab after Parler <laughs> came out or Parlay came out, but, you know, it was a previous uh, platform that a lot of people used. Um, so, so good stuff on there. Good stuff. All right. Well, um, thank you for going through the news with me there. I, I think we're kind of at the end of the show. Um, yeah. A lot of anything else you want to talk about here or shall we get into the shameless self-promotion? I have nothing to add, but maybe read to Uh, no, I'm good as well. Cool. Continue. Then let's talk about this. Something that's very exciting for me. And I think people already know about this, but the amazing Ritu Gill, you might know her as OSIN Technique. She is going to be teaching the SANS class, the SANS OSIN class with me. Um, this, well, it's in December um, in just a couple of weeks. And I'm really excited to be teaching alongside of you, Ritu, and looking forward to learning your stories and learning uh, some things from you. So uh, congratulations. Thanks, thank and, you. I'm yeah, looking forward congrats. to it. I think, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be, a, it's going to be a good class. Yeah. It'll be good. And Nico, you just finished a teach of 487. Yep. Um, you also have something else that's out there, don't you? Yes, uh, just released. Uh, it's up for beta, the SEC 537, the open source intelligence. Uh, basically, it's practical, hands-on, and a full day of Python basics fundamentals for open source intelligence, which will beta in January at the OSINT Summit. Okay. And so there are uh, seats available for that, and there's a significant discount for the 537 advanced class, yeah. right? Yep, it's, I think, um, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's 50% off. 
yeah, it's for the it's first time yeah. pretty significant. And it's only a two day class, which is yep. kind of nice as well. Yeah. Um, cool. And then lastly, something that I want to throw out there again, and I know, I know, I know this, this last part here is a lot of focus on sands, but um, realistically is that's, that's some of the things that uh, Ritu, Nico and I are, are engaged with right now and want to highlight uh, the yep. ocean summit, the sands ocean summit has, um, has had a tremendous amount of response. I'm thrilled. It's a free two-day online virtual summit um, conference that's coming up in February of 2020. Free. Uh, go ahead and sign up. I think we're going to have some really good talks. It's two days worth of content. I think I mentioned it's free. Um, it's going to be here in the United States, uh, Eastern time zone. Um, but uh, I believe the, the talks will be recorded and some of them will be pushed up to YouTube. Um, so register now. We've got um, over, I think, 13 or 14 or 1,500 people that have registered. I have really good memories of last year's one, or at least this year's. It was actually was my last flight pre-COVID. That's right. Yeah, that was the in, the in-person one was February. Yeah, it was a great event. Yeah, we're looking yeah, forward to the next one. I, I keep thinking back to that and thinking about how COVID was hitting and how, you know, we, we had people travel for that event. I'm like, mm, we had some cuffing people in class. I, I was wondering about that. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering about that. Oh, oh man. <laughs> but we shall not mention that. No. Um, <laughs> ah, all right. <clears throat> well, Nico, Ritu, thank you so much for being on and, and for uh, sharing your expertise with, with the community and doing everything that you do. Really appreciate that. Um, anything else that you want to add, Nico? Uh, one thing for the Dutch audience: next Thursday, I will be doing a web webinar with Solder EO, which is basically Attic IO. Um, it's computer nerds talking about computer stuff and those and stuff. Sounds like fun, actually. Will that be recorded or is it live on? Um, I'm not sure, but I will make sure for those interested that we have a link in our show notes. Okay. And Ritu, anything that you want to point people to? Uh, no, I think I'm good. Okay, Just cool. Keep them busy, but uh, thank you. All right, so there's only three of us here, and I think we can synchronize saying "stay and curious" now. Okay, I I think we can do this. And lock pick and peep. I think I think we can absolutely do this. All right, <laughs> so I'm gonna lead up to it, and then we'll do one, three, two, one. Stay and curious. Are you ready? Um, okay. Well, thanks everybody. That's been a, it's been a great uh, episode. Uh, appreciate again, our, our panelists, our wonderful attendees that helped us with questions and submitting their expertise. Uh, really appreciate that. And I, I guess there's just one last thing to do. Y'all, you ready to do this? We All right. can certainly try. Here we are. We're going to do three, two, one. Stay, stay, stay ocean ocean curious. Curious. We try. Sorry. We try. We try. <laughs> <laughs> I we think guess, I'm gonna have everybody did. type it next time in there. We'll all just post it in this yeah. in the chat. <laughs> thanks for coming, everybody. And we hope you have a great week. Yeah, um, thanks for joining everybody. everybody. Yep. Thanks, guys. It was, Take care. It was good. Bye. <laughs>